Uh, good afternoon. So let's uh, start uh, our uh, uh, fourth lecture. A few announcements. Uh, our TA is supposed to return back to Notre Dame on uh, tomorrow. So uh, next Friday we're going to have a regular recitation, and I don't know if he wants to have extra office hours, but he's back in town, so feel free to email him, uh, considering that homework one is already posted. Okay? Um, let's see. This Friday, so we're going to have a regular rec lecture. Okay? Uh, and remember, there will be no extra lectures overall uh, during the semester, but by teaching early, I can account for uncertainties on travel uh, in the days ahead. I will check it out, but I, it worked the link for me, but uh, sometimes you know how it works. Okay, so thanks for letting me know. And also, if you find any typos, any mistakes, uh, anywhere in the lectures or the homework, just uh, email me back and we will correct it. Okay? I mean, all the documents, including the lecture notes, they're dynamic documents. So you uh, come up with some corrections, uh, you will see those corrections, implement it uh, within the same day, if not the same hour. Okay, uh, so uh, we have to continue with, uh, you know, I hate to use the word review because I know for some of you it's not a review and it goes very fast, but in some sense you have to trust me that whatever we cover up to now, it's no more than uh, a chapter and a half from any basic book on machine learning. So really we have covered nothing. So we're going fast, but on the other hand, we have covered very little. It's reality. Okay? So, and, you know, I don't want to disappoint you talking about uh, Gaussians uh, for the rest of the semester, so we have to move even faster than the speed we have up to now. Okay? So, all right. So, uh, I'm going to hopefully cover at least three different topics. Uh, this Robbins Monroe algorithm, uh, just so you can see it, it's going to come up in, um, in many different uh, settings. It basically comes up everywhere in machine learning. Every algorithm incorporates some version of Robbins Monroe, so it's a good idea to see it now. I'm going to discuss some of the challenges of the case of dimensionality. I'm not going to give you any proofs that are in the notes, but I want basically to tell you a few things why your intuition uh, in uh, three dimensions doesn't work in high dimensions. So anything you expect it to see, you know, you're not going to see it in high dimensions, and that has implications in the way you're going to develop algorithms uh, for high dimension problems. And then we're going to start uh, talking about computing uh, marginals and conditionals for uh, Gaussians, and it sounds a trivial subject, but effectively it's going to be something that you need to get so familiar, uh, it's all over the place. Okay, so, um, so let me remind you a little bit on uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the maximum likelihood estimate for Gaussians, okay? So I'm going to talk about the, the setting for the robbins monroe algorithm for computing uh, online the uh, MLE estimate for Gaussians, let's say for the mean or the variance, but keep in mind the robbins monroe algorithm uh, is not really to compute MLE estimates, it's to do optimization, and you're not going to see that. Okay? Uh, so let me explain uh, the, the setting. So if you remember, for the Gaussian, the MLE estimate was basically 1 over n times the summations of XN, so it was the sample mean. Now, if you have uh, data coming constantly every second or faster than that, you really want to be able to do these calculations uh, as you go, which means you need to sort of compute the MLE estimate when you have n minus 1 data points, and then do some correction to incorporate the nth data point. Right? Makes sense. So that way, whatever data you receive, you account for them and then you throw them away as they come, rather than keeping in the computer uh, huge data sets, especially in high dimensions. So it comes up that for the Gaussian, uh, 
by just using the calculation we did, that this is the MLE estimate, you can actually write uh, uh, the MLE estimate uh, for online calculation as the MLE estimate when your data sets were n minus 1 plus this correction. And uh, so this is an exact calculation, right? There's no optimization or anything like that. And what is interesting is, so this is the previous estimate. And then here you really have uh, an error signal, the difference between your already MLE estimate at hand uh, minus the data point xn times uh, what we call a learning rate that here comes to be 1 over n for this calculation. But generally, we will see that this robbins monroe algorithm uh, fits sort of in this form where you update parameters using the previous estimates plus some uh, learning rate that you set. All right? Maybe you experiment with different learning rates times some error signal. This is universal. Okay, it's not uh, for the type of problems I am going to discuss. Uh, so actually, it's a little bit unnatural even to discuss uh, for online MLE estimate using robbins von Rob because there is an analytical estimate. So sort of there is an exact learning rate that gives you the exact expression. But we will do this so that we see uh, the robbins von Rob algorithm uh, uh, at work. So, uh, I'm going to give you a high-level presentation of what it is, right? And, and uh, you read the notes for the rest. So imagine that we have a, a joint distribution of two variables, zeta and theta. You can actually think z being some measurements of some variable and theta being a parameter. Uh, and um, the problem we consider is a problem where this z comes as noisy measurement. So we don't really know exactly z, all right? So for different parameters theta, you see that z comes with all these blue dots as noisy measurements. Now, at any given theta, what we're really interested in is the expectation of z. So if you look at any given z, right, there's some variability. So you're really in the expectation of z. And this is what we call the regression function. The terminology may sound weird now, but when we discuss about regression methods, you will see exactly what it means. But right now, use common sense at any theta, uh, this, because there is variability in z, you take the average on that, and you call that your function f. Right? That's all. So, Robbins Monroe, when he wrote uh, this extremely important paper, uh, what year was that? In 1951 ever expecting that this would be relevant to machine learning because there was no machine learning or to deep learning because there was no deep learning. So he wrote this little paper and the paper was about calculating the zero of a noisy function. So in other ways in our problem, our noisy function is this regression function that really we know by the blue dots. We don't really know this function f, right? And we want to find the zero of that function. So his calculation and uh, uh, looks like that. This is what we're in interested. It is an iterative calculation where effectively uh, the estimate at step n is the estimate at n minus 1 uh, minus some learning rate times the function z computed at uh, uh, the estimate of theta at the previous step. And, uh, there are no really theoretical guarantees, but certainly the constraints that this coefficient, this learning rate here to satisfy, is what you see on the bottom. And, you know, if you look at the literature, even in textbooks, there is strict guidelines as, as to what you should use for learning rates. But what is of interest to us, right, is this form, the way it looks like, okay? And so we're going to try to use this idea to compute numerically the MLE estimate of a Gaussian. Again, the MLE estimate of a Gaussian is known analytically, but we want sort of to demonstrate now, so you don't get bored, the application of stochastic optimization to this. So this is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, it looks a little bit uh, complicated, uh, but it is not, and it's actually a very good application of the central limit theorem. Will you agree with me that the MLE estimate 
uh, is defined when uh, I take the derivative of the likelihood. So I have some observations and data points. Take the, the derivative with respect to mu and I set that equal to zero. Right? That's my definition. Right? That's our MLE estimate. So I can write this, I can put uh, 1 over n inside the summation. Not that it matters, actually, but I don't need it. I can keep it outside. But I can put a derivative inside like this, then over the mu of that. Now, notice here that I have 1 over n, this derivative of the likelihood of each data point with respect to mu. So when you have 1 over n times some function evaluation at at a given data point, what does that remind you from the central limit theorem? If you take a function to be this derivatives, it is really nothing else, right, but an approximation of the expectation of uh, minus the derivative with respect to mu of log of p uh, of x with parameter mu, the whole thing calculated at the maximum likelihood point. Do you see that? I mean, the central limit theorem doesn't really care what functions you're using, right? But here we, we evaluate these derivatives at this data point xn, and I have summation over the cell points divided by 1 over n. So really, this is the expectation of this derivative. OK? So uh, in the context of the robbins monroe algorithm, uh, this is my z, all right? And if you actually calculate this derivative, if you remember the Gaussian is e to the minus x minus mu square over 2 sigma square. So if you calculate this and you put as mu the maximum likelihood estimate, right, because this calculation is at the maximum likelihood estimate, you get uh, that z is minus x minus uh, this maximum likelihood estimate of unit which we are interested to compute divided by sigma square. And right now I'm taking sigma squared to be known, uh, you know, so we don't have to deal with that complexity. So this is literally the robbins monroe algorithm because notice z is a noisy uh, evaluation because x, my data points that I have xn, right, they're noisy uh, evaluations. So it fits exactly with the previous setting setup, right, that we want to calculate the zero of the function. In this case, that's my maximum likelihood estimate. And the measurements z are basically these measurements of minus x minus mu ml divided by sigma square. And my regression function, if you take the expectations of this, is minus mu minus the expectation of x is mu. So the zero of the regression function is mu equal to the maximum likelihood estimate. But of course, we don't know mu. What we know is the noisy x. So here is the picture. We want to compute the maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, for each estimation of this parameter, uh, I have this measurement z or x that they are uh, Gaussian distributed, right? Because x is Gaussian. So this is my regression function. It's a straight line, all right? And around it, I have this noisy data. So if I have this noisy data, I want to compute the zero of the uh, regression function. So this is a direct application. If you plug in the formulas for the, uh, what happened? So if we plug in the formulas for the uh, robbins monroe algorithm, uh, this is what we get. All right? Uh, the, the new estimate is the previous estimate. Uh, this is the error that we are doing as we observe point data point xn. And then we have some learning rate that you can set arbitrarily. Remember, before we had an analytical estimate, actually, the exact estimate of this learning rate. But in Robbins Monroe, you can set anything that obeys those equations that I gave you two slides ago on the bottom. And uh, there are no guarantees that this works, but actually works 99.99% of the time. Right, that's why it is the de facto algorithm for optimization of noisy functions. Obviously, here we're using it to compute um, the zero of a function, right? But uh, also, 
uh, you notice the MLE estimate zero of a function can be a derivative equal to zero, right? Can be many things. So you can set a lot of optimization tasks to fit exactly on this Robbins von Rowe algorithm. Uh, I want you to keep that in mind because this is the heart basically of many techniques in machine learning, um, uh, big data, you know, deep learning, etc., etc. Okay, so you have seen a little bit of the Robbins von Rowe to start with, and we will come back to it uh, as we move on to uh, different algorithms. So uh, the SML estimate you can do it for the uh, obviously for the uh, variance, uh, there is an exact equation, but you can use Robbins von Rowe. Uh, you can do this, of course, for the multivariate Gaussian, right? So, uh, obviously, these analytical expressions you see, I don't think you can do them for any distribution, right? For the Gaussian, it's nice, the mathematics work, but if you give another weird distribution, uh, like student T, you can try it. I don't know if this works, but I doubt it, okay? So, you have to use a Robbins von Rowe algorithm for that. All right. Uh, I want just in passing to give you, uh, to go back to the uh, multivariate Gaussian and give you some uh, geometric interpretations that are going to be handy in the type of uh, calculations we have to do later on in, um, uh, in this course. So let's uh, uh, see. I just remind you the multivariate Gaussian looks like that. Okay. Uh, try to visually know exactly what we're talking, right? Uh, the mean mu and uh, the covariance sigma, and uh, shortly I'm gonna introduce the precision, this sigma minus one, the precision matrix as well. And we said that sigma is uh, symmetric positive definite, and actually we're going to take advantage of this in the calculations that we will do. Uh, this you have seen it, so you don't want to see it again. Uh, introduce, you notice on the exponent of the multivariate Gaussian, you have something that looks like this, all right? X minus mu transpose sigma minus one, X minus mu. If sigma was an identity, so the covariance was the identity matrix, this is a Euclidean distance between X and mu. If sigma is uh, any other uh, symmetric positive definite matrix, this is what we call the Mahalanobis distance. And um, uh, this is actually will be coming all over the place, right? It's a very sort of uh, uh, information theoretic measure uh, of distances. And actually, you know what? Even if you are not doing Bayesian calculations, like in my old days working on inverse problems, you were always plugging in if X was coming from uh, some distribution or assumed distribution, you will always plug in their sigma minus one for a number of reasons, okay? but in the multivariate Gaussian comes uh, naturally the way you see it there. Uh, so if sigma is uh, symmetric, um, uh, I can, uh, it has uh, a set of orthonormal eigenvalues. So let's call those eigenvalues ui, okay? And I'm sorry, ui are the eigenvectors and lambda i the eigenvalues. So I, these are an orthonormal set, so ui transpose uj is delta ij. All right, so what can I do with uh, those eigenvalues? Um, so if uh, lambda i and ui are the eigenvalues eigenvectors, I can expand, I can write the spectral representation of sigma. This is an exact equation. I can write this as summation of lambda i, ui, ui transpose. Remember, ui is a row vector, ui transpose. UI is a column vector, UI transpose a row vector, so this UI, UI transpose, right? They are, they are matrices. Okay, I sum all of those with weighted with the lambdas, and I get uh, my covariance sigma. Uh, I can invert this, all right? If you have not seen this, this is a good time to review some of this linear algebra. So sigma minus one is one over lambda i, UI, UI transpose. Okay. Uh, now, you remember so our Mahanalobis distance was uh, x minus mu transpose sigma minus one x minus mu. So what will happen if you plug in sigma minus sigma, uh, if you plug in this, All right? So take this, uh, plug it in inside the Mahalanobis distance, All right? 
So that sigma minus one is gonna contain terms one over lambda times ui ui transpose. So I'm going to define ui transpose x minus mu to be a new variable, uh, which I call yi. So yi is a scalar here, and the Mahalanobis distance becomes yi squared over lambda i. Can you now see why in the multivariate Gaussian the equal probability controls are ellipses, right? Isn't it, if I set this equal to a constant value, delta squared, isn't it this, uh, the equation for an ellipse, right? So, um, all right. Um, I am not gonna go through all the algebra, okay? But I am, uh, it's in the notes and actually you should look at it to get an intuition, but I'm going to tell you uh, what happens uh, at the end of the day, okay? So, so this is how these controls look like, okay? Uh, the uh, half of the length of this, um, uh, of this axis oriented with the ellipse are the square values of the eigenvalues, all right? So lambda one is the uh, biggest uh, eigenvalue, lambda two is the smallest here this in uh, 2D. And more importantly, I'm going to tell you what happens when you transform uh, the distribution from the original x variable to the y variables that I gave you. It comes up that the distribution P of y is the product of D univariate uh, Gaussian distributions in each of the yj's, where the variance in each direction yj by miracle comes to be the eigenvalue lambda j. So the lambda j is basically are the uh, the variances in these directions aligned with this ellipse. Make sense? So you know when you plot things, etc., you know you will use this to normalize to make this axis look nice. And of course you can transform this further and make the ellipse, if you like, a circle or a sphere. And I give you some of the calculations uh, in the notes. Okay. Um, so we discussed the interpretation. Uh, I want you to actually, you know, if there's something in the notes, it's for a purpose, right? It's for you to read it at least once. So uh, even though we wrote a nice Gaussian, I never proved to you that the mean is mu. I mean, you accept it, you say, yeah, the mean is mu, why? Well, the proof is in the notes. Uh, the variance is also uh, proved uh, after three slides, and that is in the notes as well. And um, so it comes out that indeed the covariance of x is that matrix sigma, okay? And uh, if uh, sigma is uh, the most general form, right, symmetric, then you need d by d plus one over two parameters to describe sigma, okay? And if you add uh, the, this uh, did indeed dimensions, if you add d parameters from u, then really to uh, define a multivariate Gaussian in D dimensions, you need D times D plus three over two parameters. So if D is a hundred or a thousand, that's a huge number, all right? And that's why uh, you will see in a lot of applications, people will tell you, oh, you know what? How about if uh, the covariance is diagonal? How about this and that? Well, this is the problem, right? You don't want to have to carry all of this but on the other hand, if you sacrifice and you put something simplistic, you may not get the physics that you are interested in. So simplified forms, um, uh, if sigma is only diagonal, you basically get ellipses that they are aligned with the original axis one and x two. If uh, all the sigmas are the same, you get basically circles or spheres. So this is very cheap because you have d parameters from u and one sigma square, so d plus one parameters. Um, so you'll be very lucky if this works for your problem, but that obviously will be the simplest possible case. Um, there's a number of slides that discuss basically, you know, the reasons why we study Gaussians, right? With Gaussians, I can write uh, any function um, to any accuracy that I want to. As a matter of fact, you know, for those in physics and chemistry, um, you know, there's a famous uh, quantum mechanics program that's called Gaussian. 
you search on the web, you may find Gaussian on Wikipedia. Somewhere down the road, you say Gaussian uh, quantum uh, mechanics, you know, DFT type of calculations. And the reason they call it Gaussian is because the basis functions for solving the Schrodinger equation are Gaussians. Okay? Uh, and in chemistry, actually, there are hundreds of codes for doing these type of calculations using Gaussians. Now, in the context of machine learning, we're not really going to use, um, well, we will, but you know, it's not like we have to, to use basis functions that are Gaussians. But if we have to represent something in a form that is amenable to sort of analytical calculations that will accelerate computing, then uh, if Gaussian is not the right distribution, then a mixture of Gaussians would be the right distribution. Okay? And uh, when you have a mixture of Gaussians, means you have to enhance your probability model with what is called a latent uh, variable setting. So imagine, you know, that in addition to x that we had before, you now have these z variables that if z equal to 1, you have that Gaussian. If z equal to 2, you have that Gaussian. If z equal to 3, you have that Gaussian. And you make z to be a random variable that you cannot observe, but you maybe can uh, compute from data. Uh, so this gives you this Gaussian mixture problems. So Gaussians are going to be very, very important uh, in machine learning uh, as we go along. So don't take this as just calculations to fill lectures with uh, things that are not needed. We need those. OK. All right. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about um, some intuition. Uh, the, there's a lot of derivations that are very simple, mostly geometry in the, in the slides. So if you look at them, and I'm going to tell you uh, only the conclusions, the proofs are never more than a few lines. Okay? But if we start going through every line, uh, we will basically come back to this lecture for another uh, three days. Okay. Uh, Castle dimensionality. So let's uh, take sort of a naive problem where we want to classify, we have data uh, that represent, let's say, different physics. Okay? And uh, in this case, we have, let's say, you know, two variables, all right? And somehow we want to be able to classify is if we observe some new data point, we would like to say, is it blue point? Is it red point? Is it green point? What is it? Okay? I mean, that would be the task of classification as we will uh, uh, see later on in the course. So, uh, someone will say, well, these are the data points that I have, and I know what they are. These are blue, these are green, these are red, you know, whatever colors they are there. So, let's split this in uh, little uh, uh, squares. And uh, if it happens, let's say, a new data point is on this square here, I can see, uh, you know, how many red points I have, how many blue points I have, and assign my point to the color with majority void, if you like. If I have more blue, I'm going to say, okay, my point then has to be blue. All right? Now, this is in, in uh, two dimensions, so if you split this uh, in four, you get this square, you get 16. Now, if b is equal to 100, 100 by 100 gives you what? All right? Gives you lots of points. If it is um, in uh, 50 dimensions, all right, you're in trouble. So any partition of the stochastic space, uh, it doesn't work. Hundreds of papers, right, in, uh, in many different sort of uh, settings, but if you start partitioning in high dimensions and say I'm going to uh, split it like that and do something local, etc., it just doesn't work. Even if the calculations locally are trivial, simply because, you know, even in three dimensions, you cannot do it. The number of, uh, uh, you know, of cells in this case would be d to the cube. So d a thousand, a thousand to the third power, that's too much. Okay? So that's one example of the case of dimensionality and, and partitioning the stochastic space. Let me give you another example. Um, in uh, let's say so we have um, uh, we are trying to fit let's say a polynomial in d dimensions, and uh, the order of polynomial that we would like to keep uh, 
things just the simple, is a third order polynomial. Okay? So x is in d dimensions, right? And we feed the third order polynomial. So this is the most ex general expression uh, that you can think uh, of uh, writing a regression function um, in, you know, in polynomials against the, using these monomials xi, xj, xk, keeping only uh, up to third order uh, terms. Okay, this is very general. So in the notes, I am uh, computing for you how many of these terms I have for given m and d, how many of these terms, and how many total w's do I have. And uh, when you do the calculations, I am only going to go in the bottom. Of course, you are going to read all of this, uh, right, out of curiosity, because there is a good application of counting and using Stirling's approximation. But let's say if you have 100 dimensions, and you have a polynomial of order 3, which is miserable, I mean, you don't expect to fit things with a polynomial of order 3, the number of terms is 176,851. So this is how many unknowns you have, all right? And later on, of course, because we work with, uh, we will work with Bayesian inference, all of these 176,851 coefficients W are going to be random variables, and you're going to have to compute the posterior of, of all of them. Cannot be done. I mean, okay, this, we can do it actually, but generally you understand it's a, you know, it's not a way out. Okay. So. Um, so that's a problem, all right? And, and again, another indication of this curse of dimensional. Uh, let me give you something that uh, sort of, uh, uh, it, will, uh, it will take away your intuition about what you understand about Euclidean geometry. So let's say, uh, that again, the derivations are in the slides. Uh, so let's say, say that um, I have a sphere of radius one in D dimensions, right? D dimensions, not in three, not in four, in hundred dimensions. And I want to compute the relative volume of a sphere of radius one from a sphere of radius one minus epsilon, where epsilon is tiny, very small number. So uh, now, you know, don't read what the slides say, but you know, if somebody tells you epsilon is 10 to the minus five, what do you expect this ratio to be from intuition? This is the volume of sphere 1 minus the volume of sphere with radius 1 minus 10 to the minus 5. So how much do you expect that to be? What's the common sense answer? Zero. Well, let's see what happens when you plug in the actual volume in D dimensions. It comes up to be 1 minus 1 minus epsilon to the power D. And regard if epsilon is a small number and D is a big number, you remember x to high power? Uh, for x less than 1 goes to 0. You remember this from your high school studies of sequences? So this converges as d goes to infinity, converges to 1. So what does that mean physically? This is weird, right? What does it mean physically that the sphere of radius 1 minus the sphere of radius 1 minus epsilon, that this ratio here goes to 1? What does that mean? So where is the volume of this sphere in D dimensions? I mean, if you cut out of this volume the piece that corresponds to radius 1 minus epsilon and you still get 1, that implies that all the volume of this sphere has to be where? On the boundary. So there is the intuition that is basically broken. And, and actually, uh, I was in a meeting in, in, uh, in Scotland you know, in May, and there was uh, a statistician who was using this idea to get, to get some beautiful estimates of various statistics of distributions simply by exploring this concept that things happen only on the boundary. All right? Um, so this has a lot of implications because if somehow, uh, what we say is for the Gaussian, right? Uh, you do calculations where you have to average in, in space in high dimensions. Uh, whatever you do, 
in the bulk of the sphere is waste of your time because the volume is on the boundary. Now, obviously, this has implications when you write algorithms. All right? And I'm going to come back to it. Okay? So, um, this is just a plot showing how when d becomes large, this is close to 1. Okay? Uh, you follow these calculations, they are uh, very simple. So, let me, since we talk about the sphere, uh, let me give you uh, another reinforcing result, again, against any intuition. So you have a sphere. So let's say you uh, you cover the sphere with a cube that touches the sphere on the middle of this cube, right? Now uh, this calculation says that the volume of the sphere divided by that volume of the cube goes to zero. Wait a second. So you have the sphere. You put a cube that surrounds that sphere, a tight cube around the sphere and the ratio of the two volumes goes to zero. What does that mean again? What is the volume of the cube then if when you remove the sphere, this thing goes to zero? So we talk about spheres, right? So let's talk about this uh, hypercube in three dimensions. What is the volume of that cube? Again, it's on the edges. All right? So, uh, again, um, let's say, you know, and uh, I don't know if it will come most probably, you know, you start saying, okay, I have 10 dimensions or 50 dimensions, and I need to sample there, and I'm going to sample uniformly. It is very possible you start, uni you sample uniformly on a, on a hypercube, and 99.999% of the time you waste your time. Okay? Uh, so, um, I tried to convince some engineers the last uh, year or so uh, on this uh, argument. I failed, okay, because they were insisting on this uniformity on doing everything, okay. Uh, but obviously, this result tell you, sorry, you are uh, wrong in that context. So let me uh, also tell you something further about your intuition. So if you have a Gaussian, right? Uh, and let's take the mean of the, uh, the Gaussian to be zero, right? So the center of uh, uh, x equal to zero. At what point is the, the distribution the highest for Gaussian? Don't, don't read the slides, okay? Just forget, it doesn't say anything. So for Gaussian, where is the, with mu, with mean equal to zero, where is the maximum of the distribution? At x equal to zero, right? That's common sense as in 1D or 2D, you know. So that's a nice result. But when you want to calculate the probability mass, right, that's what you are interested. You remember probability mass is like P of x dx. Now we have to worry because we said weird things about the volume. So if I have a Gaussian and I multiply it with the volume, I need to account for the fact that the volume is on the boundaries. Right, the mass. Okay, um, so uh, who is the probability mass for a Gaussian maximum? Is it at x equal to zero for this particular Gaussian? Let's say. Well, it comes up. It's not at zero. So the point where the probability mass is maximum is completely different from x. The point x equal to zero where the PDF is maximum, and uh, it comes out that uh, the maximum of the probability mass. Right, so this is the probability, the multivariate Gaussian uh, multiplied by the volume, and it's written here in polar coordinates, where all the other angular variables have been integrated out. The calculations, again, are on, on the following two slides. It comes out at the maximum. It's some other location from x equal to zero. And at that maximum location, the probability mass decays rapidly with the dimensionality d uh, as I move away from uh, this peak. Okay? So here it looks a Gaussian, and it actually, in the approximation I have in the slides, uh, two slides down, this probability mass looks like an exponential like that, but this distance, where it decays, uh, uh, becomes um, uh, smaller as d increases. So basically, for a uh, multivariate Gaussian, the place where the probability is maximum it's not the same as the place where the probability mass is maximum. 
against, again, uh, counter uh, uh, intuition uh, uh, situation here. And I'm sure if you search in books and papers, you will find even uh, lots of interesting uh, things why uh, you need to worry about high dimensionality and why whatever the algorithms you develop, you need to keep these things in mind. Otherwise, uh, you may be wasting resources. Um, I mean, can you imagine in this case, uh, again, trying to sample uniformly when the probability mass is concentrated, you know, in a very small domain. Uh, so uh, that is uh, not good. So anyways, I give you the derivations here. There is really, the calculation is extremely simple, okay? So you can uh, uh, read it. So uh, if you search on uh, the computer, you know, Google um, catch of dimensionality, you will find uh, a million, 10 million uh, references because this is one of the hottest areas uh, and one of the unsolved problems basically, not just in machine learning, but in physics, like in quantum mechanics, right? I mean, so everywhere is this many body problem is related to the case of dimensionality. Now, the good news that if you read the, this slide is basically, even though things look uh, very tough in uh, high dimensions, in reality, many data sets live in smaller dimensions. Uh, so the underlying dimensionality of data that otherwise look high dimensional is low. So you need to sort of find what that low dimensionality is so you can do the calculations right, okay? And uh, we will explore this um, uh, ideas as we move along in this course. All right. I think this is the first lecture that we're doing, doing good with time because I see this is slide 47. So uh, there is a hope that we will finish the whole lecture today, all the planned uh, slides. Okay. I am going to uh, make you feel bored here with some um, otherwise simple calculations, but I will give you two examples, uh, but they are not simple so you can start imagining what would be possible if you can compute uh, conditionals and marginals of uh, Gaussians. So uh, let's say we have a, a, a multivariate Gaussian in 100 dimensions, right? So what I want to do is I'm going to partition the vector x in uh, two components, xA and xB. And the reason why I'm going to do this, uh, you can think of many applications. Maybe uh, let's say xB is known and you want to only know the probability of xA given xB. Uh, or maybe you want the marginal of xA or you know you want the marginal of xB. Okay? Um, later on when we do Gaussian processes, this is the type of thing that we will try to, to explore. But right now we want basically to split x into pieces and come up with uh, equations for the uh, conditional of xA given xB and uh, the marginals of xA and xB, okay? Uh, the equations, they are not, uh, I mean, they are not difficult to derive, but some of them look complicated. So don't expect to memorize those, right? You need to know where to look. So when you have to do a calculation, you look carefully uh, and you use it. Now, of course, if you use something, it helps it at least once you did the derivation on your own, so you don't uh, accuse me 10 months from now that I mess up your thesis because there was a typo in the notes, or a typo in uh, Murphy's book or Bishop's book, etc. All right, so you need to convince yourself that these are correct. Okay, so let's see how we're gonna do this. You remember X is a Gaussian with a mean mu and a covariant sigma, and because I want to partition X in xA and xB, this implies a partition of mu like that and a partition of sigma like that, where um, uh, this partition, this sigma AA and uh, sigma BB are symmetric, all right? And sigma BA is uh, uh, the transpose of uh, sigma AB, okay? So this is, uh, again, all results from the symmetry of sigma, and this is the partition that I have. A lot of times in the calculations we will do today, uh, it helps uh, often 
not to work with sigma, but to work with the inverse of sigma, and we call this already the precision metric, so we partition the precision metrics as well uh, to the metrics that you see here with the same symmetry conditions, right? The inverse of sigma is also symmetric, so it obeys the, the same equations, um, you know, as before. Now, pay attention that this, for example, uh, lambda AA is not uh, the inverse. So when you partition like that, it's not the inverse of sigma AA, right? It's not the, the inverse of that. All right. So uh, let me tell you a trick before we start for these calculations. And um, the trick um, that all statisticians need to know is the what is called completing the square. Uh, have you heard the concept of completing the square uh, anywhere else? Yeah, I mean, in your statistics classes or probability, what does it mean completing the square? I mean, I'm sure you're not going to see a chapter in a book that says completing the square, but you know, everybody knows that you have to complete the square. So, what does that mean? We're talking about Gaussians, right? And you remember uh, in the exponent, we had a quadratic form. So there was an x transpose sigma minus 1x, and then there was a linear term in x. So if I throw you something, and you try to fit a Gaussian to find what the variance and the mean is, what do you need to do? You need to put it on this form. And this is what we call completing the square. Right? Now, it is very possible that you won't be able to complete it, the square exactly because you are missing some uh, constant terms. Well, those constant terms will come uh, to play a role somewhere else. But, for example, if, if I, let's say, if I give you only the right-hand side, obviously you can complete the square and tell me you have something like that, right? Uh, and, and, of course, you know, there will be a difference by a constant, but immediately you can see that this is a Gaussian. Right, x transpose x, x transpose times another con uh, constant vector, that's a Gaussian. So, when you play with Gaussians, you have to uh, be able uh, to complete the square, even if it looks a horrendous calculation. And it's a standard process, okay? So we will explore this idea today. All right, so le let's start. Uh, let's say we want to compute uh, the partition of uh, xA uh, given xb, okay? So you know, xb, we fix it some uh, value of a vector, and we want to compute the conditional. So actually, this is the easiest of the calculations, because effectively, uh, this is the exponent of our original uh, Gaussian, and I expanded the term, right? You remember x and mu are partitioned, sigma m minus 1. Well, I, I use lambda instead. It's also partitioned, so if I uh, do the multiplications, these matrix vector multiplications here, and I expand it, I get something that looks like that. So from this expression, I need to, to extract the conditional of xA given xB. So what do you think I should do? So this expansion is exact. So what terms, uh, what should I do in this expansion to extract x of A given x of B? and the type of distribution of x of a given x of b. I mean, this is the easiest of the calculations, because x of b is given. So what do you do to this expansion? You try to find the condition distribution of x a, and x b is given. So what does it mean x b? When I look at uh, this expansion, uh, what do I do to x b, you know? Visually, you know, what should I consider when I see xb? Well, I consider it to be just a given value. All right? So when I want to compute the probability of xa given xb, I need to concentrate on all the attempts that involve only xa. Because xb is given. So if you only concentrate on the terms that have xa on them, what type of um, uh, terms do you get here? Do you get a quadratic term and a linear term in XA? You do? Look at this, right? I see XA transpose lambda AA XA. That's the only quadratic that I see. I see a lot of linear terms there. 
And I see another linear term here because this is constant, right? So I see xa transpose times all this. So I see a linear term and lots of constant terms. So what do I need to do to compute p of xa given xb? I need to complete the square. Okay? So I need to put this in what form? I need to put it in this form. I need to have uh, xa transpose the inverse of some matrix or some matrix here that I will call the precision times xa plus another term that's going to be xa transpose times uh, this precision matrix right, that you identify from there times some uh, vector which is going to be constant and that vector is going to be the mean of the conditional distribution so from that quadratic term you uh, if you identify that matrix with your precision and once you know the precision and you identify the standard multiplies x that will be uh, will give you the mean so if you do all of this uh, uh, you get the following nice result all right that the condition distribution uh, has this mean that is given by this expression and has uh, a, um, a precision lambda a, a okay and by the way if you try to do this calculation using variances not precisions maybe the calculation will take uh, two or three slides rather than uh, this one page calculation that you see here okay so again nothing to memorize all right so uh, the conditional has um, you know uh, a nice variance of precision which by the way you notice it's independent of the given value of xb this is interesting results so the variance doesn't depend on xb but you notice the mean is linear in xb this has implications in uh, uh, in various places later on all right so the mean is linear in xb the variance doesn't depend on xb all right so we define the conditional okay uh, the marginal is trivial i'm going to give it to you in a, in a little while um, uh, but uh, but first let me just tell you about uh, this uh, Woodbury uh, lemma that uh, you need to know it because when you program things uh, you, uh, if you don't account for this Woodbury lemma you will be inverting a matrix of uh, 100,000 by 100,000 when it's maybe possible that you, you only need to invert a matrix 50 by 50 okay anybody heard of the Woodbury lemma yep okay so in um, I mean in all the libraries that use for machine learning it's already implemented in right but if you write your own algorithm this is something uh, um, you need to account when you uh, you do this type of operation certainly when you work with Gaussians and that's why again you see the partition uh, of the metrics that are uh, similar to what we consider for covariance so let me, let me motivate the idea here right imagine that this was the covariance matrix we had in every type of prediction task that we will have to do in this course and in every aspect of machine learning we're going to have to find the inverse of the covariance okay now um, so you can formulate this matrix if it's hundred thousand by hundred thousand and invert it and good luck or you can start thinking about this partition inverse formula and the Woodbury formula that we will see in two or three slides uh, and in particular this formula says that if you want to invert uh, this partition matrix A, B, C, D uh, basically the, uh, it involves a partition of uh, uh, the matrix D as you see here all right? and what is called the Snur complement of the original matrix with respect to D so the inversion of the D and this new complement with respect to D it's easy to remember this uh, uh, complement uh, matrix because if you start with A and you go uh, clockwise you get A minus B D minus transpose C okay so this uh, looks like that so if somehow it comes out let's say that M is a much uh, smaller size matrix than the original matrix then immediately you can see that you get a lot of benefits using uh, this sort of uh, uh, 
uh, inversion process. Okay. How do you prove this? Well, one of the ways to prove it is you accept it as this, you take this, and you multiply with that, and after two pages, it comes out to be correct. Okay? The question is, well, how did people come up with this, right? It should not be uh, rocket science. Well, the answer actually is not very difficult, and the calculation is the following. If you start with the original uh, uh, ABCD metrics, you can actually make it a lower block diagonal uh, matrix by multiplying by that. I mean, when you take uh, linear algebra, computational linear algebra, like, uh, you know, Charles Van Loon's uh, book, you know, um, if you multiply with that, this becomes a lower block diagonal, okay? Uh, you take now, so you multiply with this on the left. If you take this and you multiply on the right with that, then it becomes a diagonal. And if you combine the two things, there is the answer. All right, nothing very complicated. So uh, let's see. Uh, so, and, and, and of course, you can uh, this complement, uh, the sub complement in B. You can uh, use maybe a complement with respect to A. So here's another partition. All right. So if the inverse of D of D was of high dimensions. You may want to try to involve here an inverse of A, because maybe A is of lower dimensions, okay? And in particular, you can think of this was the covariance matrix, right? And let's say um, you, you measure part of, uh, let's say, XB, and you don't know XA. Then you look at the size of XA versus XB, and you decide uh, what partition is beneficial for your problem. So uh, if you take these two decompositions, so the inverse, if you use uh, the, you involve the D complement, you get this decomposition on the top. If you involve the A, you get the decomposition on, on the bottom. Uh, and if you start equating things and you say, this term has to be equal to that, you get this equation. Uh, if you say this red term is equal to that, you get that. And then also, uh, if you take the determinants of this equation, you get this. And again, they may look all Chinese to you, which may be good, but on the other hand, these Chinese formulas are extremely important because they can save your life uh, uh, when you do computations. Uh, and I'm going to give you two examples, I think, in the next slide. So let me give you two examples. So here is the uh, one of these uh, uh, Woodbury uh, uh, inversion formulas. So I'm going to consider a very particular case. So let's make A to be my covariance matrix, which is n by n. So this can be actually, let's say, the empirical covariance matrix. Okay, uh, and it is and n is very high. You collect the billion data sets, but the dimensionality of the problem is, let's say, thousand. Okay, so. Uh, so uh, let's assume that um, uh, B is the same as uh, C transpose equal to X, okay? And this B and C transpose matrix are of size N times D, okay? And I'm going to assume that uh, D and D inverse is with a minus sign the identity matrix uh, in uh, D dimensions, so D by D, okay? So again, the original matrix was N by N, this uh, matrix X is N by D, all right, where D is much smaller than N. So if you plug in things there, uh, trust me, there's nothing but substitution, you get the inverse of sigma plus XX transpose equal the uh, inverse of sigma, okay, minus sigma minus one times X times the inverse of x of i plus x transpose sigma minus one x, and this matrix is of dimension d by d. So, can you just extrapolate where uh, this will be useful? Uh, the symbols used x and sigma here are relevant because they are going to come up like that. But can you think where this calculation may come to be extremely handy and standard almost? in uh, many aspects of machine learning. Think of X, 
So if you remember, we were talking about sequential estimate of MLE and things like that, right? So how about if you, uh, you have to work with the empirical covariance and you need to invert the empirical covariance as you get data to do predictions. We will talk about all these things as we go along. So let's say sigma is your covariance now and x is your new data step that you collected. All right, so if you like, x, x transpose is the edit covariance. Once somebody will say, oh, keep track of all your data, add this and then invert. That's not good. The idea is, as you get data, update sigma, invert it, uh, keep that inverse in place. As you get new data sets, update the previous inverse. Don't really compute. And that's what this formula tells you. So when you get new data sets, uh, use your previous sigma inverse, and the inversion you have to do is only of this matrix that you see here, which is d by d. So it's your choice uh, if you want to invert high dimensional data or low dimensional data. Okay? Uh, this, don't expect to do a calculation and the calculation to come to you and say use the Woodbury limit, I mean, uh, uh, lemma. Uh, you basically have to look for this type of tricks because. Uh, uh, they are not obvious all the time. Uh, you have to look for them. Another trivial formula, again, uh, this is sort of a standard calculation you learned in, um, in uh, linear algebra, computational linear algebra, like in, uh, in Van Loon's book. Uh, so if you do a rank one update of the uh, inverse, so if you want to invert A plus U V transpose, where U and V are vectors, well, you know what? You don't really need to recompute a new matrix A prime and invert it. Here is a rank one update of the inverse of A plus UV transpose. Uh, very nice formula. And this is very handy because, again, this will be very handy. You know when? It's like the previous formula. The difference is that, that the matrix X is one data point in D dimensions. So if you get one data point and you want to, uh, you know, uh, computer your inverse to upgrade your uh, predictions. This is a beautiful formula using this uh, uh, Woodbury uh, lemma. These calculations will come up uh, in many places, especially, you know, for sure when we discuss about Gaussian processes um, and many other places. All right. All right. So, um, uh, the, uh, so we, we're discussing, we we'll go back now to the, uh, you know, the conditional distribution. So when we invert it, uh, we wrote uh, uh, one of the uh, Woodbury formulas basically looking like that, using this matrix M. So effectively, uh, this is my precision matrix is equal to the inverse of the covariance matrix. And using this formula, if I invert this uh, sigma matrix, it looks like that. So obviously I can write immediately that lambda A, A is equal to this, lambda A B equal to that, lambda B A equal to that, etc. So I can extract uh, nice formulas that connect for me uh, the, uh, this partition of the precision matrix with uh, uh, the covariance matrix. You remember we said lambda A, A is not the inverse of sigma A, A, A. It's much more complicated than that. And lambda VB is even more complicated. Looks like that. Okay? Uh, and all of these results are uh, an outcome of that formula. Okay, so um, uh, this you can uh, reverse, of course, uh, rather than inverting with uh, uh, these identities the sigma matrix, you can invert the lambda matrix. Uh, and it looks like that, and then you can put sigma, alpha, alpha, etc., in terms of the lambda partition. And uh, so, before when I wrote these formulas for the conditional matrix, you remember, uh, so we, uh, the conditional matrix, it came up in, in terms of uh, lambda, the, uh, the covariance was lambda AA minus 1, a very convenient, nice formula. You can write now this in terms of sigmas. Uh, looks a little bit more complicated. Uh, in terms of the lambdas, the mean was given like this. If you want to write in terms of the sigmas, it looks like that. 
right? And all of these are using basically uh, these uh, decompositions that you see in these slides. The marginal distribution is a little bit more complicated in calculation. So the marginal uh, computation is complicated because now they're not going to say, let's say we need P of XA. They're not going to say I'm going to fix X bit some value and see only the values of XA and recognize a quadratic there and say that's my Gaussian. Because when you look at the marginal, you know what that means? That you have integrated XB out. So I don't have time to, uh, to go through all the details, but can you tell me what's the story? How, you know, using this um, uh, closing the square idea, what calculation do I need to do to get rid of XB first? Because that's important. So XB, you know, it, it comes in the joint distribution. So it, it might be a quadratic term uh, and a linear term and possibly coupled with XA, you know, because you can, um, you know, for example, like I see here, there's XA, there's XB. So what do I need to do first to start moving towards integrating XB out? So I need to complete the square what variable? If I recognize a Gaussian on XB alone, then I can perform the integration of the Gaussian analytically because I know what is the normalization term in my Gaussian. Right? Can I do that? So I need to identify all the quadratic and linear terms on what variable? XB, and then put it in the form of some Gaussian that I can say now I can integrate this exactly. And that's exactly what we do. All right? So if, let's say, all right, uh, well, I don't have to tell you anything. Okay, so here it is actually the calculation is trivial. Uh, if you con take all the terms that involve XB, this is what you come up with. You come a quadratic term plus a linear term, which is, uh, you notice XA comes there, all right, which is no problem, plus a lot of other terms that don't depend on XB. Can you make this to look like a Gaussian? Of course you can, but you have to add an extra term to complete the square, which is this term. All right? I mean, this is not very difficult, right? Immediately from there, you know that this is the precision matrix because you remember the square? This is inverse variance there. So uh, immediately from there, you can, and this term, you can identify what the mean is, which is this. All right? M is given to, with this parenthesis. So anyways, you get the quadratic form that you have in the exponent of the Gaussian. Will you be able to integrate that Gaussian exactly? Of course. All right? But don't forget, you need to keep this term that is going to be left out. And why do you need to keep this term? Because M is, depends on XA, and you are interested in the distribution, the marginal distribution of XA. So you cannot get rid of XA. All right? That's our goal. So if you do all of this, uh, where's my answer? The answer comes to be a very simple one, like a miracle. The marginal of XA, and remember this, you remember how we partition the mu? The mean of XA comes to be mu A, a result you can use it immediately, basically, and the covariance comes to be sigma A A. So for the marginals, the answer in terms of sigma is a straightforward one, right? For the condition, I was a little bit complicated. If you want to write this, um, oh, so basically I summarized here also the conditional. So here was a little bit more complicated, but here is uh, a little bit more obvious. All right, 439. So let's see. You know what? I have uh, uh, five, six minutes to give you two examples. So here is, let me go uh, to uh, the picture. So imagine uh, we do interpolation of the function um, between some uh, points where I give you what the function values are. And let's assume there is no error at the points, this crosses that I described to you the function. Okay? So basically, I have a function in X. I prescribe the values with no error at those crosses. And I am asking you to compute uh, or estimate for me 
in some sort of interpolating sense because we haven't done any Bayesian modeling yet. So I want to, to tell me uh, the values of the function potentially with the uncertainties involved in uh, in between those crosses. We understand the problem? So the problem again is I give you the values of the function at these x points and I want you to interpolate for me let's say for example at the point 0.5 point or 0.6 and I want you to tell me how confident you are on, uh, on those uh, predictions. This looks like Gaussian process modeling, by the way, as an introduction, but we haven't said anything about Gaussian processes. So let me tell you what the idea is. I am going to use what is called uh, a prior model for the values of x. And this prior is what is called as smoothing prior. Smoothing prior in a sense would be a prior that somehow will force my function to be smooth as I move in X. So you cannot just jump exponentially up and be discontinuous as I go from this cross to another delta X and another delta X. So this smoothing prior, and there are many different types of those, uh, it looks like a Gaussian, all right, uh, has um, a precision L transpose L, and I'm going to tell you in a second what L is in the particular example. Uh, and if you write this, uh, the exponent of the Gaussian explicitly, you get minus uh, lambda over 2. All right? This is from, you remember, um, in the exponent, right, the, the, this uh, lambda will go on the numerator because the, covari the variance here is 1 over lambda. And so you get uh, lambda over 2 Lx uh, squared. So what's lambda? Here's the intuition of how to get a nice lambda. The intuition is that every point x, uh, let's make it to be an average of its two neighbors. Is that a reasonable assumption if the distance between points is small? I mean, that's what I call a smoothing uh, assumption. So I'm going to make uh, the x value to be related with this formula. And because I'm not very sure uh, that this is correct, I'm going to say plus some noise, and I'm going to make that noise a Gaussian noise defined by lambda. By the way, if you don't like this smoothing, you can smooth the derivatives, you can take a Laplacian there, you can do miracles. Okay? So if you do all of this, uh, the lambda matrix basically comes uh, on what uh, I saw here with this little thing. So my uh, smoothing prior is what you see on the top. And now the problem, you know what it becomes? It becomes a trivial problem of having a multivariate Gaussian, which is, this is my, my multivariate Gaussian, where I know some x's, and I want to compute the value of this function of the other x's. What do you need to do on that? Very simple. You need basically to compute the partition, you remember, of the covariance or uh, uh, of the lambda matrix, and that requires the partition of uh, this L matrix here, on, uh, and you partition it based on the points you don't know and the points you know. You remember if you have a big Gaussian in X, some points you know the values, you put those on the bottom, on the top you put what you don't know, you know the conditional, there is the answer, and you get this beautiful picture that looks very much like uh, what you will get uh, when 10 weeks from now we discuss uh, Gaussian processes, and you will say, what, why have the error bars? Well, you have the error bars, you remember, because uh, P of X is a distribution. It gives you uh, the uncertainties also, right? And what are these little lines? They're samples from uh, P of X A given X B gives you samples of X A. If you want the mean, then the mean is the nice dark line that you see passing smoothly through the data points. If you need samples of X, are these little uh, lighted lines, okay? And uh, uh, so uh, you have basically error bars, you have the mean predictions, you have samples, the capture correlations, you have everything. I have two minutes. Uh, they never turn off, uh, off the, the, the video for another five minutes. And rather than taking pictures of me, let me take you another example, uh, relevant to computer science people, but also, you know, maybe to others. Imagine that, um, uh, so you collect data, right? 
And um, to do calculations, you have to build your, your covariance matrix, your empirical covariance matrix. Uh, that's what we're talking here. We have to do inversion and things like that. But let's say your data were corrupted, and in your design matrix that you contain the data points, so you give, you know, x1, row 1, x2, row 2, etc. some of the data is missing. Because, you know, your sensors didn't work out, so you have your covariance matrix has a lot of elements here and there that are missing. Can you compute those, can you compute uh, those data points uh, with uh, this concept of uh, uh, condition distributions in Gaussians? Right? The idea is, if all of them come from a Gaussian distribution, a high dimensional Gaussian distribution, if you look at each road and you know some elements, you don't know the other ones, the condition distribution is a Gaussian. All right? So with this idea, you can actually take a metric, and uh, let's say, uh, the, uh, in this case, the metric was uh, a Gaussian in 20 dimensions, uh, and um, uh, these are, in a given row in the covariance matrix, the missing uh, elements, and these are the mean computed values, and these are the true values. So if things are correlated, and certainly if they are Gaussian, you can use this concept of conditional uh, Gaussians, and you compute not only the mean predictions, you actually pr uh, can produce the error bars, okay? And there is a little computer program from uh, 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 Memphis uh, Toolkit that